Yeah, so uh, my name's Cody Hill with Packet, and uh, Packet's doing some pretty cool stuff in the IoT space with Sprint, and uh, so I was here to kind of talk about it on how we are utilizing open source and uh, some bare metal hardware and Sprint's 5G network to achieve autonomous drone delivery. So pretty cool stuff. Um, there's a, a nice glamour shot of me. Um, and uh, I've been in the industry for a while, um, done everything from, you know, computer, plugging in computers for people all the way up to uh, you know, being the lead cloud architect at General Electric. Um, I, I've been in the startup world for the last uh, five years. And I, I worked for Platform9, who does uh, managed OpenStack and Kubernetes. And now I'm at Packet, uh, who does bare metal as a service. Um, so I, I like to, and, and maybe the, in this uh, forum, the, the users don't have the ability to just shout out questions uh, and unmute and shout out questions. But uh, I like questions as they come. And I try to like kind of pause and answer them. Uh, so I do have the Q&A panel open. So if you have any questions, throw them in there. I'll kind of pause and, and try to do that. I like to keep this as interactive as possible and kind of have like a nice discussion. Okay. Um, so basically what we're, we're covering today is kind of like who is Packet, right? What do we do? And um, then, you know, how the Sprint Curiosity folks fit into this. And... Uh, the we're going to be you know getting physical servers on the edge how do you deploy those how does that what does that look like um the, the software needed to kind of build a um, an edge iot warehouse and analytics tool so you can visualize all of the metrics that you're collecting um and then putting the software on the hardware and this was going to be demos but this is normally a one hour talk so to condense it down to 30 minutes we're going to show some screenshots and talk about those so sorry about that but uh yeah, it's a lot of content. Cool. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so who's Packet, right? So so Packet uh, was founded in 2014, um, and we are a bare metal as a service company, right? So we are a cloud. We have REST APIs to spin up infrastructure, and um, but instead of getting virtual machines like almost every other cloud out there, we're giving you bare metal physical servers. Um, we have over 20. Uh, locations that we have servers, um, a little over 150 uh, team members of Packet. You can get a physical server in less than 60 seconds, which is pretty cool. And we have a lot of people using our platform. Um, and we have over 60,000 uh, servers being deployed on our platform every month. Now, a lot of those are CRUD operations, right? So we're not growing by 60,000 servers a month, but uh, a lot of them are spin up and spin down. Um, and we used to talk a lot about our VCs, but we got acquired by Equinix in uh, uh, March, right? So it's been about a month now uh, being part of the Equinix family. And uh, we're really excited about the partnership between Packet and Equinix. Um, and one of the things we'll be able to do is take bare metal into hopefully every single one of Equinix's data centers and, you know, then leverage all of the interconnections and all of that uh, coming in our in our fully integrated product uh, next year. So we're really excited about that. And uh, it's been great being part of Equinix so far. All right, so uh, you want to deploy physical servers to the edge. That's cool. Um, on Packet, uh, we have a lot of ways to do that, right? So uh, off to the right, you can see we have a web UI that you can point and click your way through. Um, spin up where you want to deploy the server, what type of server, what operating system. You can then specify uh, like cloud init data, your user data. If uh, you want to automate that, uh, do some automation on that server once it's spun up, um, and a few other things. That's that's cool, but you know we're trying to do DevOpsy things and and you know infrastructure as code. So. We also have a, a pure REST API that, uh, that you can utilize. You, this, this is a valid curl call other than the auth token. Get your own auth token. Um, and you can spin up, uh, spin up a server with as little as uh, those few parameters. Um, or you can utilize our Terraform or Ansible uh, plugins, um, as well as if you just want to write some code, we have Golang and Python libraries as well. Right? So a lot of different ways to spin up a server on Packet. 
Um, and you know, our goal is to get infrastructure to developers. So uh, that's why we have all of these integrations. So how is Sprint involved here, right? So um, basically uh, Sprint decided they're gonna build this IoT network, right? So they're going to have the, the fastest 5G network for IoT devices on the planet. And they really, with 5G, you have to rethink completely the way that you do cellular networks, right? They're not doing them uh, with custom ASICs and custom hardware and all of that. Everything's down to commodity hardware and software, right? Um, so that, that allows Sprint to be able to deploy on commodity hardware that Packet uses. And they realize that their core competency isn't going into markets and opening data centers and racking and stacking servers and figuring out power and cooling and all of the goofy stuff that uh, you have to do if you want to go open a new location uh, somewhere on the edge. And that's what Packet's really good at, right? That's, that's what we do, is uh, we provide infrastructure in a bunch of different geographic locations. So this is a great partnership where they said, hey, look, we're going to put our finger on the map anywhere in the U.S., and in less than 90 days, I want to be able to hit your API and get a server in that location, right? Um, and you know they they are extremely pleased that we're able to do that in less than 90 days for us we're like man we could do that in like 60 days so great 90 days is perfect right so um it's a really good partnership where they could focus on their core competency which is building a world-class iot network and we can focus on our core competency which is delivering bare metal servers to the masses right so, so that's what we're doing here with sprint and in order to uh, make this thing work, um, on top of Packet, you can deploy any type of software stack that you want, right? So you could deploy a VMware hypervisor because we are bare metal or open stack uh, hypervisors um, because it's a bare metal server. So you can do that. Um, you could deploy Kubernetes um, on our servers. And we have uh, a cloud control manager and we have uh, a CSI driver and uh, node autoscaler plugins, right? So we don't build our own Kubernetes distribution. Uh, we're not offering a managed Kubernetes service, um, but we have a lot of partners that do. And so we built all of the, the plugins and tools for Kubernetes to work really well um, for those partners. And then you can stack on top of that uh, low, level, low level infrastructure, any combination of applications you want, right? So for this drone delivery project, uh, we chose um, four, uh, you know, the, these four solutions. Um, we uh, built it on top of Kubernetes. Our persistent database layer is Postgres. The application layer is in Node.js. And then our web layer is uh, through Trafic, right? So um, that, that's the, what we decided to use um, in this platform. And uh, we decided to use uh, the K3S distribution of uh, Kubernetes because it's designed for the edge, and this is a very edge uh, use case, so we thought that'd be cool to, to use K3S in this uh, scenario. Okay. So this is what it looks like, um, <clears throat> and uh, we, we did this with uh, a lot of friends of Packet, right? So uh, I think Alex Ellis, who's speaking uh, a little bit later, uh, was part of helping us get this off the ground. Um, and we did utilize uh, OpenFAS to, to get this uh, working, right? So this is kind of the, the architecture of what we did. Um, we spun up a, new, a, a K3S Kubernetes cluster, which comes with Trafic. Uh, we then had to uh, throw Cert Manager and Let's Encrypt in there because, you know, security, right? Um, we then uh, stood up Emitter, uh, which is an open source MQTT broker, which we'll get into that in a little bit. It then uh, has an MQTT connector with OpenFAS, and then everything's using OpenFAS functions to insert stuff in the database, pull it out of the database. Uh, we have a function to render a map so you can see where these drones are in real time. And then uh, we're utilizing Metabase and Grafana uh, and Mapbox to visualize everything that we're doing here. Right, so pretty cool. Uh, and I want to kind of drill into a lot of these open source components uh, and talk more about them, right? So the first thing is Kubernetes, right? Uh, if you're here today and you don't know what Kubernetes is, um, somebody has failed you, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Kubernetes, but you know, this is the definition, I think, off of Wikipedia of what Kubernetes is. It orchestrates containers and the connectivity between and to those containers, right? Uh, across 
multiple nodes. That's my elevator pitch on what Kubernetes is. It's awesome. And it really helped us, um, you know, do the heavy lifting here, right? And um, so, so now we're going to focus on Emitter down here. So Emitter is a uh, MQTT broker and it focuses on doing two things really well, right? There's a lot of MQTT uh, brokers out there and a lot of ways to talk, but they, they wanted a completely horizontal, scalable uh, broker. And uh, they also wanted um, the security built into this thing, right? So um, every time that you spin up uh, a new channel to, to speak on um, in MQTT, you have to generate unique keys and all of that. So they have security built in and um, it's horizontally scalable. So you can, you know, as your, your need goes up, you can just scale multiple replicas inside of your cluster and you're in good shape. Um, so then we uh, kicked off OpenFAS, right? So uh, OpenFAS is functions as a serverless or a serverless framework. Um, and it really takes a lot of the complexity of working with Kubernetes um, down to some basic primitives, right? You could spend more time writing your code um, and then just deploying that into OpenFAS and let OpenFAS handle a lot of the complexities of Kubernetes for you. Um, and you, you know, really just focus on that Docker container and the code you wrote rather than all of the other primitives inside of Kubernetes, such as deployments and load balancers and all of that stuff, right? So OpenFAS kind of simplified this process for us. Um, Prometheus, um, this is something that you kind of get for free inside of this deployment. When you deploy uh, OpenFAS, it comes with Prometheus. So um, for free, we're able to uh, see our ingestion rate of um, messages from our drones, right? So because uh, OpenFAS is automatically uh, connected to Prometheus and every time a function is triggered, we're able to see that metric, see how long that function call took, and all of that, and every time a, a drone sends us data, that's an open FAS function. So we're able to re retrieve all of that data, um, put that into Prometheus, and then visualize that and, and see uh, what our ingestion looks like and all of that. So um, really good. Uh, we're able to visualize that data with Grafana, right? So Grafana is an open source uh, visualization tool that you can build uh, awesome charts um, and uh, graphs and all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, Grafana and Prometheus are like peanut butter and jelly. They work really well together. And, uh, you know, we have that deployed looking at that Prometheus data that OpenFAS is, is inserting, right? Uh, Postgres. So uh, Postgres is a, a really well-known, but, and also quite, you know, older database, right? We could have done something a little more modern, like, uh, I don't know, Mongo or CockroachDB or something like that. Um, but we decided just old school Postgres works. It, it fits our needs. Um, we really didn't need to get too creative there. And uh, it was really easy to deploy and get up and running. And it fit really well inside of all of this. So um, yeah, we, we deployed Postgres. Uh, we, we were looking at doing something like CockroachDB and being scale out. Um, but it's not pure Postgres. So some of the adapters that we uh, needed to use such as uh, Metabase, we were unsure if they would work, so we decided not to risk it and just used pure Postgres. But I would like a, a pull request accepted. If we can get this thing working with Cockroach, I'd be happy. Uh, <laughs> so I'll show you the GitHub repo later for all of this. All right, Mapbox. So Mapbox is uh, an open source tool and you can also, they also have a SaaS offering, um, but it gives you the ability to visualize on a map in real time uh, a bunch of different data points and gives you kind of a, uh, a REST API and an SDK to drop stuff on a map and, and kind of tell your story that way. And, and it's used by a lot of different applications, right? Most notably, Facebook uh, uses Mapbox. Um, and I guess the Weather Channel is probably pretty popular as well. And those guys, uh, they, they use Mapbox to kind of handle all of the mapping, right? There's no reason to build your own mapping libraries and all of that. Uh, Mapbox is open source and it works really well. All right, Metabase. So Metabase is really cool, right? So it's a, a BI tool, business intelligence, um, and it does a lot of work for you. Um, it'll see a bunch of uh, location data that you've put into a database when you just point Mapbox at, or sorry, Metabase at 
Postgres and he goes, hey, this looks like a bunch of coordinate data. Let me put these on a map for you, right? Uh, and it'll automatically visualize that on a map for you, right? You'll, you'll then see, um, a, it'll see a metric inside a database um, that's very linearly dropping or very linearly going up, such as uh, maybe the battery life of a drone. And it automatically detects that and goes, you know, I'm gonna build a line chart for this and just slap it in there so you can see the uh, how your drones are doing from a uh, a battery perspective. So so it's a BI tool that's like actually intelligent. It's pretty cool and it's open source. Uh, so it was great to slap in here and, and and actually get some visualization of what these drones are doing. And then you can um, obviously build much more complex dashboards and and build on top of what they give you. Um, but it's a really really great tool. Um, so now we're going to jump into the screenshots of this. I normally have a live demo uh, of deploying this thing from the ground up and then uh, kicking off the drones. And you can kind of see the drones swarm over Las Vegas. Um, and this is uh, what the code looks like on the left. We have a GitHub repo. Um, it's uh, github.com slash packet labs slash IOT. Um, there'll be a link later on in the slides um, for that. Um, and there's a Kates directory there, which basically has a Terraform script that will deploy this whole thing end to end for you. It'll deploy Kubernetes, um, all of your functions, emitter, Mapbox, the whole ball of wax, right? Um, takes about 10 minutes to deploy. And uh, then you have your environment up and running. And, and the, when, it, when it kicks off, off to the right, uh, that screenshot is what you see um, when it's complete, right? It's, it's built. Um, it's, it's four things and, and life is, is happy. Okay. Um, once that's done, you have a server inside a packet. This, this is a, a big screenshot of the packet UI. Um, so you have a public IP address, you have IPv6 addresses. Um, all of this can run on our T1 small system, which is, uh, about seven cents an hour, right? So it's a, it's a smaller, um, smaller system and, uh, this entire stack runs pretty well on it. Uh, eight gigs of RAM, quad core Intel Atom processor. Um, so you can go ahead and kick this guy off and uh, you know let it run for quite a while without breaking the bank. And this is what a live run looks like of this application, right? So um, as you can see right here in the kind of top right here, we have a hangar, and that's where all of these drones are, uh, you know, originate from. Okay. And then off to the left, we have a warehouse in Northwest Las Vegas and uh, a warehouse in Northeast Las Vegas. So when we kick off these drones, what they're going to do is these drones are going to go drop off a payload at these warehouses. Um, and uh, this is a bi-directional communication channel that we have from the, the Node.js controller that we built and these drones. So uh, the drones are, are reporting back temperature, battery, uh, latitude and longitude um, of their location and then where they're going. And uh, the controller is sending back to those drones, you know, stop. You might be, you're about to run into another drone, right? Change your altitude up or down. Um, there's also some other things that these drones are sending back, such as wind, right? So if, if you get a really windy area, uh, you want to have your drones avoid that windy area. You also might want your, your drones to avoid no-fly zones, right? You don't want them flying over airports. So this controller, uh, the, the only thing that we send to these drones is go drop off a package here, right? And then we're utilizing the Sprint low latency network um, that as these drones are flying 50 miles an hour, we're telling them, hey, uh, don't collide with this other drone. I want you to pause, uh, then go up, you know, 20 feet, and then resume your destination. Or I want you to pause, I want you to reroute, you know, 300 yards to the west, and then resume your, uh, your path to your destination, right? So um, it's a bi-directional communication here. And you can see, you know, kind of live, you know, this drone has 100% battery life. Um, we can click on that on the, on the map. This is map box that we're looking at. And we can tell it to return to hangar for whatever reason. Maybe this thing's uh, in the middle of its, its trip, and we notice its temperature is super high. We're like, okay, that's not normal, right? It's running at, you know, 80 degrees Celsius or something. This thing, parts are gonna start melting off of it. Uh, let's return this thing to the hangar 
and see if we can get it fixed, right? Uh, we can close an entire warehouse up at the top left. Um, so if we click, you know, close the Northeast warehouse, all of the drones from the Northeast warehouse will uh, head back to the hangar, right? So very bi-directional communication we have here. Um, this is a, a screenshot of, of the controller logs. Um, so you can see that uh, actually what's happening here, like uh, drone six is flying in a windy area, right? So we're gonna pause drone six. Um, and then we're going to, so it sends a pause command, then we're gonna change its altitude, right? So we're gonna set its altitude to 50, um, uh, 50 meters. And then we're gonna tell it to resume, right? So, uh, and then we're gonna, you know, it, we're gonna read that data from the drone again. You know, its uh, location has changed a little bit. Its altitude has changed. We also want to adjust it again. So we're talking to these drones and constantly pausing them, setting uh, their altitude, setting their destination. And doing all of that. So this thing, uh, when you run this live, uh, scrolls so fast you can't make out one word. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a still image on what it's doing just with drone six alone. You can see it does quite a bit of back and forth and some minor adjustments uh, to that drone. Okay. So that's about it. Uh, <laughs> that, that's my, my demo that I have so far. So if you want to try this out yourself, I, I hear Packet is sponsoring $25 in cloud credits if you use their, uh, the promo code that they gave you. Uh, I'm going to quadruple that uh, because you watched my talk. Um, using the curiosity code 100, uh, curiosity 100 as the promo code, um, you can get $100 in free cloud credits. Um, go to baremet.al slash IOT. That'll take you to this GitHub repo. Um, where you can actually kick this off and try all of this stuff yourself. Um, and that's about what I had for today. So it looks like I got done a little bit early. Uh, we have some time for, um, for some questions. So any, any questions you guys want to throw into the q and I'd be happy to, uh, happy to answer. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Cody. While we wait for questions, from the uh, from the audience, uh, I had a couple quick questions. Um, so you had mentioned that you use K3S as your Kubernetes backend. Yeah. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time playing with K3S. Um, we know it's five less than K8S. Right. Um, so it it it's not full featured. Um, and I was wondering if you encountered any problems with uh, disabled admission controllers or anything that you needed and kind of had to add back into K3S or if it was sort of good to go out of the box? Yeah, it was good to go out of the box. We built this as, as a stateless application. So, you know, out of the box, the, uh, the, the, the volumes that uh, you create are just to a the local server, right? So, you know, if you lose that box, you lose your data. So all of the map box data that you've collected and all of that. Um, so that was one thing we could have added a, a, the, the packet CSI driver to the system to actually deploy those two persistent volumes. But uh, we really wanted this to be uh, deployable by a single user on a single node uh, to kind of show the power of what you can do with the Curiosity Network. So um, everything kind of worked out of the box. Uh, traffic was good enough. It, it did everything we needed. Um, in other projects, I've replaced traffic with Nginx load balancer. Um, but no, this thing worked pretty well. We, we almost replaced uh, the runtime with Docker uh, instead of using the uh, container D runtime at K3S, but we were able to tweak a couple things and make it work with container D. Um, so yeah, it, it actually worked pretty well for us. And, and we built this with, uh, b before K3S went to 1.0. Uh, and so it's pretty early on. Now K3S is, uh, I think on their third revision, they changed the, uh, the versioning now they're doing like kubernetes versioning numbers but um no it seemed to work pretty well cool so speaking of versions how are you uh keeping everything up to date uh, uh it through uh new k3s versions yeah so we pinned the version in the repo uh to deploy uh only uh k3s i think we're still deploying 1.0 uh in the repo so uh i should probably go through and update this to everything um we're utilizing uh part of um, uh, Ketchup, uh, Alex Ellis's, which I think he changed to Arcade. So we should really move all of this to, to Arcade. But 
So to deploy versions of uh, different Helm charts and stuff, we're using Ketchup uh, to do that. So that kind of helps the versioning and, and all of the uh, dependencies there. So we're basically pinning versions to make sure this thing works. Cool. Awesome. And have you found any uh, interesting backend failures as a result of, um, of, of using K3S? Honestly, no. Uh, it, it seemed to work pretty easy. Like we, we don't have an extremely complex application here, right? Like everything we're deploying is uh, off the of Helm charts, right? So uh, Prometheus deploys pretty easy. Um, OpenFAS deploys very easy and everything's kind of built off of, or sorry, I meant Postgres. Uh, and then everything's kind of built off of Postgres and OpenFAS, um, you know, so everything just worked. It, it was pretty easy. Uh, we got pretty high ingestion rates uh, using, uh, you know, coming through emitter. So emitter is not going through uh, traffic uh, because traffic doesn't do TCP load balancing, right? Or TCP ingress, it only does, uh, maybe it does now, it didn't used to. Uh, so we're, anyway, we're doing a node port uh, uh, with uh, emitter, so everything's going directly through that, and it works fine. Cool. Um, speaking of of networking backend, um, so I know five G is uh, higher power, but somewhat shorter range than three G, four G. Have you? encountered issues with drone connectivity and how do you handle that if a drone goes offline but is still in the air yeah so um we we haven't uh you know in, in, everywhere we've tested the drones we've had a very good coverage uh, but we do have uh, built into the drones uh, application if they uh, lose connectivity they are to uh, basically go way up in the air uh, as high as they're allowed to uh, and then make their way back to uh, their, their ba back to the warehouse and slowly come down at the warehouse. Um, and there's a, a, or sorry, the hangar. And there's a location in the hangar that is for drones to come and land that are not uh, connected to the controller to tell them not to collide with other drones, right? And so uh, luckily the 5G coverage has been good. We haven't lost connectivity yet, but we do have uh, that that code to make them land safely um, in case that happens. Um, cool. Yeah, and, and and the drones do have uh, a small amount of uh, uh, motion sensor on them to try to do quick maneuvering operations if they get really close. Um, so there's that as well. So I imagine with actual physical objects flying through the air, you have a lot of regulatory and compliance uh, concerns to deal with. Um, yeah. How, how challenging was that? And is it just a matter of implementing the right uh, logic in your code? Or was there a lot of, uh, you know, red tape, bureaucratic stuff to, to go through to actually get drones in the air? Yeah, luckily, the end customer that we were uh, working with on this project, uh, already went through all of the red tape that they needed to get, you know, access to fly drones above a certain height and in a certain area and all of that. So uh, we didn't have to do any of that. Uh, we just got to show up and write some cool code. Um, but yeah, I assume as this becomes more and more popular, the regulations will go up and you'll have to, uh, you know, include more, more code and maybe even like a, a back door to these drones or something for the regulatory agencies to see where they are. Um, so yeah. Right. Um, and so uh, when you say a backdoor to the drones, do you mean to the individual drones themselves or to your log servers or how, what, yeah, what does so that the, look the, like in your head? So the, and it may, maybe backdoor is a bad word, but uh, where these drones are actually submitting their location to not just your servers, they would also have to submit them to, um, you know, a government server saying this, hey, I'm over here, right? So, and then hopefully that becomes bi-directional because if you have three companies trying to run drones in the same metro, you know, you can't, and these drones fly pretty quickly, you can't have them all just use vision to not hit each other, right? right. They, it, you're gonna have a problem. So hopefully this becomes a bi-directional thing where I say, here's my drones, here's where they're going, here's their elevation, here's their, you know, all of that. 
and then you have a, a, a way to pull that data in and send that out to your drones to make sure that they're not on the same path as a third party's drones. So right. none so, of that's been thought of yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, so do you see a, uh, a spec or framework emerging uh, for that kind of information? Because that seems like it would it, it'd have to be something that's uh, standardized across the board. Yeah, not that I'm aware of yet. Um, I'm sure there's smarter people than me uh, looking into all that right now. Yeah, I guess a, a drone collision is a bit more serious than a packet collision. Right. Cool. Yeah, you, you can have dropped packets, just not dropped drones. Right. <laughs> was, was that a packet pun? <laughs> I'm sorry for opening that up. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I don't have a klaxon loaded up, unfortunately. Um, Fair enough. But uh, know that uh, that we really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I think it's it's uh, fascinating to see sort of the the tentacles of Kubernetes, you know, branching out into the physical world. Um, we spend so much time looking at white on black terminals that uh, it's easy to lose sight of the actual, you know, real world consequences of of the work we do. So, really interesting talk. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks.